Everybody, hello! It is eight o'clock here on the East Coast, and I think it's time to finally talk about the Safari modules. Just to get it out of the, oh, I gotta turn the music down here. <laughs> Just to get it out of the way early, the uh, I last night, two days ago, I don't know. I had a sort of change of heart about the modules and decided instead of calling them the Zoo modules, I was gonna call them the Safari modules. I think it sounds better and it, and it uh, better illustrates what my goals and ideas are for them. So anyway, everything in the past where I've talked about the zoo modules, it's the same thing. I'm just calling these the Safari modules. Now I, you know, I'm entitled to change my mind. So today we're going to talk about finally series one is available. You can order them now and I wanted to run through them. Sort of talk about that. I know that I've done this in the past sort of scattershot here and there, but today I'm going to sort of laser beam focus in and we're going to talk about each module. We're going to run through the feature set of each module, maybe listen to them a little bit and uh, yeah, I'll answer some questions in the chat. But like, I would like to thank everybody that has ordered them already. <laughs> uh, unless you watch these videos all the time, uh, I didn't upload any audio examples there's no video examples on the website or anything so you really do the people that order them i'm assuming you ordered them because you watch the live streams and you're a member of the community here and it's it's really cool so thank you very much they're going to start shipping next week everybody that's got them and i appreciate it these are limited we made 200 of each which i hope will be enough to sort of satisfy the main sort of crew and get everybody what they need but there is 200, we're not gonna make any more. Uh, we have other zoo modules or safari modules that we're working on and we'll talk about those at a later time. But today the focus is on the giraffe, the gibbon and the crow. So let's start by talking about the giraffe. It's sort of the quickest one. We can get through it relatively easily and then we can move on to uh, sort of the meteor modules, so to speak. The draft really is, you know, it's a utility module and it's it's 4 HP, which I guess is its 
main feature is that it's kind of small. It is the first attenuverting mixer that we've ever made. Uh, and for various reasons, I haven't done them in the past, but I wanted, I've been, for a while, I've wanted sort of a four HP attenuverting mixer for various bits and pieces here. And so I thought this is an opportunity to do it. Uh, switch my camera view here. Okay, so you can see my disembodied head over in the corner, but we're gonna talk about first the giraffe. And if you've looked at the webpage and if you've downloaded the sort of manual or documentation for it, you will realize that there is a error on the panel. It says two instead of four for the bottom channel. We're gonna call that a feature. And my mistake is now out there for everybody on the internet to laugh at, and I'm okay with that. Uh, for about a minute or two, I thought about rerunning the panels, but again, because these are limited edition, because there's only 200 of them, and to be, to be fair, the giraffe graphics are dark enough that they're almost impossible to read anyway. Uh, I didn't, I didn't see a reason to do it. I kind of like it like this. It's, it'll be a quirk that lives in infamy. So to talk about the giraffe here really quickly, we have a four channel mixer. If you're familiar with our two plus two mixer that we've done in the past, then you're going to be very familiar with this. There's a couple little extra trick weeks to it uh, but for the most part if you understand our two plus two this is going to get you 90 percent of the way there so it's four channels and each channel has a dedicated input and a dedicated output if you patch into the output that breaks it out of the mixer chain so channel one and channel three if you patch into the output that breaks the input input out of the mixer chain, it becomes an attenuverter, a standalone attenuverter, which is very cool. So you could use that somewhere else while you still have access to the full mixer. Channel two and channel four, the outputs break up the mixer. Well, channel two does anyway. So if you patch into the, the output of channel two, it breaks channel one and two and it becomes a two channel mixer. What that allows you to do then is have a two channel mixer up here and a two channel mixer down here. Again, just for a case, you know, this size, the size of mine, the 420, it's nice. Sometimes you only want to mix a couple things. And now I have two two channel mixers to do that with. This is all sort of inspired by the SV1, which has the same mixer topology in it. Uh, obviously, the SV1 doesn't have the outputs per channel, but it does have the mix out one and two that breaks it apart. One of the features that I added to the giraffe that are Lifeform's 2 plus 2 mixer didn't have is the normaling of channels 1 and channels 3. And I'm actually utilizing that right now. I've taken the output of my ADSR here, I've run it into channel 1, and because it's normal to channel 3, I also have a second version now of that ADSR out that I'm running into my VCA. So it, it acts, in the case I'm using it now, it's sort of as a splitter where I can split that ADSR. The top channel is mixed with a random coming from the gibbon, and then that the ADSR mixed with the random patches into the filter cutoff of the crow. That's how I'm using it now, and it's a good example of how flexible the giraffe module really is as a mixer and what you can do with it. If it's the only mixer in your case, or even a, you know in a larger case like this, it really does a lot of audio gymnastics to get audio in as many places as you possibly could want it to be. So, I there is a there is documentation on this on the website. You can check it out, download it. There's also uh, on the two plus two mixer webpage. There's documentation with a with a. a, a nice graphic that sort of explains the signal path of the two plus two. So if what I said doesn't make any sense or if it's confusing, you can check that out and get the details. I know I'm talking quickly because I want don't want this video to be four hours long. So that is the giraffe module. I'm gonna now move on because I think everyone is here really to talk about uh, the sort of feature modules of the Safari Series 1, and that is the Crow and the Gibbon. So we'll talk about the Crow first, because I'm concerned that I'm going to get into some rat holes with the Gibbon, and I don't, again, I don't want to uh, 
don't want this video to get too, too long without at least covering a little bit of all the modules. So let's talk about the Crow first. What we're listening to now is I have two crows patched in series. And to listen to one crow, I will pull that out so we can just hear. And we're gonna turn all of our extra processing and whatnot off because the intro is over. And just listen to some raw sounds now. So I have, right up above here, I have a primary oscillator, which I'm just pulling a saw wave from. And I had it FM'd, which I'm even gonna pull that out for the time being. We'll just, we'll just get a little drone going on here. Okay, this is a saw wave going into the crow. And we're modulating the crow, like I said, with the envelope and a random signal from the gibbon, but we're gonna pull that out as well. So I guess I could clean all this up so you can maybe see what we're doing here. So now this is just a saw going into the crow. We're listening to the low pass output. Be a little dry for my my taste so let's try something a little bit more exciting here just a little bit more exciting I don't want to get don't want to get too crazy it's just a terrible eight step sequence but it'll get us there So you can hear it, we'll listen to this for a minute, then we'll talk about what it is and how it works. That's the low pass. Here's some high pass. always does funny things to my brain <laughs> when I uh, when I have headphones on don't understand why replace with my brain and back to low pass here okay so let's talk about what this is is a state variable filter core. This is the same filter core, yes, clay like that's in the SV1. This is the Pittsburgh filter. Uh, what we've done is added our custom overdrive circuit to the beginning of it. So we can overdrive the signal like crazy into this overdrive circuit and then dump it at a perfect five volts for the filter. Oh, excuse me. Oh, sorry about that. So with that, we have our 75X gain on here, which just pushes everything to the limit. We could even use a sine wave here. I could show you. So here's a sine wave going through the filter. And even though it's 75X, 
works, what happens is because we're limiting it, it never overdrives in a sharp way. Um, it's it's overdriven without sounding nasty. So it does destroy sounds, but it does it in a really, really pleasant way. slide through so to sculpt it a little bit. But that's the that's the gist of the crow. So we have our overdrive here and we have full left is off. This also acts as the gain for the whole circuit. So this is your overdrive. So you have off to 75X. And obviously it's 75X. You don't... The resolution from off to 75 is going to be relatively poor because, you know, that's a lot of gain in a very small turn of a pot. So this is not a precision knife, but if you need a hammer, I think this is a, this is going to do you nicely. So we have our filter cut off here by our resonant. Now the Crow, as typical with our Pittsburgh filter, it doesn't self-oscillate. But with all, you know, the topology of a state variable filter, what you have is 
the ability, or the theoretical ability anyway, for infinite gain in the resonance without overdriving. So the amount of resonance available is directly tied to the gain of the input signal. Uh, and that's where we spent a lot of time sort of tweaking it because we wanted to make sure that, yeah, we had this crazy overdrive gain, but at the same time, we wanted to leave room. There had to be some headroom there for the resonance to play around with. Otherwise, this is as good as it would have got. So we spent a lot of time on that, sort of tweaking those ratios to make sure when you do want something super resonant and super liquidy, you can get it. And now full left, or nearly full left, you do get those nice clean sounds. So nearly off, you it will pass the signal clean so you can get that same classic Pittsburgh filter sound out of it. But it really excels at when you turn up the gain. Just the little kick drum trick with the low pass gate where you use a low pass gate as a kick drum uh, then pass it through a filter to roll off the high end the crow is fantastic for that because it just the kick is just so powerful then gnarly distorted kick drum which of course now I have to demo because you can't mention like something like that and not prove it right so let's see if I can prove it. Okay, so here's the kick drum that I use every time Herman and I perform. Herman uses the same kick drum too. It's off to the left here of the screen, but it is the low pass gate module. resonance when I when I'm working on the kick but so that's full open So that's what the kick drum. I love how this thing sounds. Now I've sort of touted these modules, <laughs> sort of uh, showcased them as these are bits and bobs that Michael and I are working on for, for other projects and these are uh, some of this stuff will go into the Voltage Lab too. Some of it will go into other projects. The, excuse me, the Crow itself, uh, it's not slated for any specific module as is. However, what we were testing here, how far we could push the drive and what we could get out of it certainly is going to go into a future module uh, or I mean a future instrument. So it's not going to come out in the same format as the crow or maybe something that resembles the crow but understand that what we learned from how far we were able to push this absolutely is going to carry into something we're working on and i gotta say when i first heard this thing i was thrilled that it sounded as good as it did because it really opens up a ton of possibilities for us what we can do with this thing i'm very very happy can't remember what I oh I lost my patch. <laughs> I can't remember what I had the gate patched into. Let's see here. Well we're gonna patch it into here. Go from there. Okay, so that is the crow. It is I didn't mention all these modules are four HP. 
none of them really use a ton of power. So, and all that's listed in the documentation. Uh, but the key is this, this stuff is 4HP. We've never done a filter at 4HP. We've certainly never done an overdrive filter like this at 4HP. I think for the size of it and really the idea of it, it's, it's really cool. Uh, I know uh, Soy Sauce, who I, I jam with, we're going to be jamming on uh, Wednesday night again coming up here. He asked for six of them total. He he wanted two per voice so he could pre and post shape sounds um, for his setup, which I, I thought was crazy, but he's digging it, so I like it. So let me figure out how to make this make a sound again. And we can go from there. All right. Here we go, we're back to... <laughs> I feel like that's wrong. Let's try that again. I think that goes there. There we go. Okay. So we're back to our basic patch, and I, I think if you guys have any questions, uh, at me in the live chat so I can see and I'll answer questions about the crow now um, as I sort of clean up the patch and get ready to talk about the gibbon because I think the gibbon is going to consume a bit more time. The concept is a little more confusing maybe and I think it's it deserves a little bit extra time to discuss. So I'm just going to pull all these patch cables out so you have some, some chance of following the signal path perhaps. And we can go from there. I'm so glad that these things are finally available. The, I feel like we've been working on these things. And then I feel like they were sitting in the shop waiting for us to have a minute to finish them for months and months, it seems like. Hasn't been, but man, it sure feels like it. So I'm glad to get them out. I'm glad that... Everybody that's been asking for them over the last three or four months finally has an opportunity to uh, maybe fill that little bit hole, hole in their case with something they've been waiting for. I, th I think you're gonna dig it. Man, they sound really good. Is it an analog or digital oscillator? Um, I'm not sure which oscillator you're talking about. All the oscillators in my case though are all analog oscillators, so I'm gonna go with analog. Would the Gibbon complement the game system well? Yeah, it depends, I guess, on how much random you need in your case. Obviously, the game system does a lot of different kind of sequencing and a lot of different types of randomized sequencing or pseudo-random sequencing. Uh, and the Gibbon is sort of only does pseudo-random sequencing. So it has two channels for it. And if that's, if you need more of that in your life, uh, um, I think it will. I'm sorry, I, my, my eyes are terrible, but uh, Wafeli, I'm going with that. Wafeli wants to know when the modules will, sh will ship. They are available in the store now. They're gonna ship next week. Typically we ship on Wednesdays and Fridays. I suspect there's gonna be a lot of orders over the weekend though. So we're gonna do our best to ship out Monday or Tuesday. Just to pay, it's just, there's three of us in there working on the stuff, so it's how quickly we can get the boxes packed and shipping labels on them and you know printing and you know it's a process. For three people it's to manage a couple hundred orders is um, it's time consuming. But they're built and they're ready to go. It's just a process, just you know, all the boring stuff of boxing them up and getting them out to you guys. If that makes any sense. So this is the longest I think I've chatted without ever making a sound. So we're gonna go and do that. Now, these patch cables here, this is 
a VCA. This is an analog delay, which you can see is just on full dry. So that's, and then this is going to the mixer. That's what we're listening. Um, but we're going to focus now on the Gibbon. So I'm going to patch just a really, really boring sound into here for the moment. And we will go from there. Well, maybe, maybe not that boring. I don't want that boring. We'll go through the crow and then out into the world. So that's what it's doing right now, but we're going to trigger it. So let's hit the VCA with an envelope. Great. Now we have a way to trigger a sound using the Gibbon. <clears throat> and we're going to talk about this left Gibbon here. This patch cable here is syncing the clock. So the clock out from the left is synced with or being the, used as the clock for the one on the right. And I'm going to take out B here, and we're just going to patch that into the envelope input over here. And assuming it's in the right mode, eventually, I should... There we go. And we'll take the envelope... There we go. That's a little more interesting. So what's happening now? Let's talk about the given. What this is. This is a variable length shift register, randomized shift register. This is based on the ideas, based on really the concept of the random generator in the Buchla Music Easel. However, the it really deviates wildly from anything more than just the concept of it. Um, I don't know exactly how they're doing the random in the Buchla Music Easel. I, that really didn't interest me, other than it, theirs was based off a shift register in the past. So I sat down and I said, well, let's, let's play around with this idea and see if I can come up with something that works for the voltage research laboratory. So the, the sort of genesis of this code, because this is a digital module, the Gibbon, was for the random outputs of the voltage research laboratory. And the goal was something that was random, but also uh, maybe a bit more musical. So the idea of a shift register is great because what you do is you essentially have a sequence. And in the case of the voltage research lab, you have a six step sequence. And the shift register was six steps long. So it would just cycle through those six steps. Now, every time it's triggered, I'm just going to patch in a CV into the pitch here. There we go. You know, we'll go into FM so it doesn't change quite that much. So, the idea of this shift register is it runs like a sequence. It gets a clock signal and it jumps to the next step. And because it's randomized, there's a chance that when it jumps to the next step, that value will change. I like to think of it as it forgets what the value was and it has to create a new one. So what the Gibbon allows you to do. So that was the that was the voltage lab. It was a six step shift register. It was very simple. Uh, there wasn't really a whole lot you could do. You could go in and through some deep dive settings, you could change the chance it would trigger. Uh, but for the most part, it was relatively static. And I think in the context of the voltage lab, I think it was really cool because there wasn't a whole lot of UI there. There was no way to add more. But I always wanted to explore that idea a lot deeper. So when I started to develop the concepts around the Voltage Lab 2 and what was going to be in the Voltage Lab 2, I really thought it was important that I took a, a closer look at this idea of a shift register and see if there was a way that I could integrate it, something that was a little, maybe a little bit more interesting or a little bit deeper than what I had done in the Voltage Lab. So the Gibbon was really it started out as that. It was really just a playground for me 
to dig in and see how far I could push it while still maintaining a an understandable user interface or a simple to use user interface, certainly, a musical user interface. Um, Michael and I always have conversations about what we're working on and you know what we're designing, where you know all the problems we're trying to solve. And one of the things we talk about all the time is that we have to remember that we're solving musical problems not necessarily engineering problems. Uh, the engineering solution a lot of times isn't as musical as you want it to be. Uh, it ends up being too clean or too simple or too pure and you lose a little bit of a little bit of what makes uh, analog or what makes uh, music creation interesting. So the given it was really uh, give and take of playing around and seeing what I could put on here that didn't make it feel like you were working with a spreadsheet, but instead created something that is, it's slightly less than purely random and you do feel like you're interacting with it, but at the same time, you are you getting a, sh a pseudo random shift register. So all that said, long story short, uh, what I've added to this one, and we'll just go through the, the bits and pieces here. So the top knob here is stages, and that sets the length of the shift register, the number of stages in the shift register. It can be anything from one, full left, all the way up to 24, full right, and you know anywhere in between. And again, because there's 24 stages here, it's going to be very difficult because of the resolution of the pot to dial in exactly how many stages you're looking for. That's kind of by design because it shouldn't really matter for what you're doing, how many stages you get because, again, it's pseudo-random. You're never... Uh, that pattern is going to evolve. It's never going to get stuck in a loop where it's repeating and repeating and repeating. What you're just trying to do is give little bits and pieces to catch your ear that remind you that, okay, oh, this is... This is that thing I was hearing before, although it's a little bit different. That's the idea. So whether you're using for a pitch like we're using it for now, or you're using it for a filter cutoff, or you know whatever the source is, you're going to hear patterns, but you're you're going to recognize that they're changing. Whew. So anyway, that's the stages. We have it set to I don't know. Let's say that's 16 because I don't know. Next we have spread. And spread actually does two things, and I, I struggled with, I struggled with this a little bit because I wanted, again, I wanted to make it easy to use, but I also didn't want to make it easy to dial in exactly um, what it did. I didn't want you to turn this and say, okay, I should be getting this out of it, uh, because that's not, that kind of takes away from the the pseudo randomness of it. So. What spread does is spread sets the uh, the width of change, so to speak. So if a voltage does change, spread determines how far it can deviate from its previous state. So if it was, say, one volt was coming out of it before, and we have spread full right, that gives the full voltage range of chance that it's going to land on those. And as you dial it back, it limits the range to, say, a 2-volt range or a 1-volt range or a half-a-volt range. However, it doesn't completely eliminate the odds that something is going to go the full range, but what it does is it's almost like a bell curve. So if you have it set real tight, sure, most of the time it's going to be very tight, but there are going to be outliners that jump way out of the way. Again, uh, because you're what you're doing is sort of giving it an idea of the ranges you want, but because it's random, it has to it has to uh, it has to live in its own world and it has to sound natural. It is a gibbon, for goodness' sake. We have variation after that. Variation. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I forgot the second half of spread. I'm zoning out here. So the spread does two things, like I said. It does, when something changes, it determines the opportunity that change has to separate 
and how far it can separate from the original value. But it also sets the depth or the chance that, um, well, you know what? We'll get back to that because I, the way the knobs are tied together, I think it, it would be easier to explain in another way. So let's talk about variation first. And variation is a little bit simpler. Variation is the chance something is going to happen. So if I turn it full left, you can see we've lost most of our steps. If I turn it full right, we have a lot more chance that things are going to happen. And if I if I bring up the tempo here, a nice fast tempo going. Tighten down my envelope so you can hear all the little bits. It can get pretty pretty dense. The idea is that it has the main beat, which would be the clock. So we call that the whole note. Um, and there's uh, that that's the note that has the most chance of happening. And, but then there are the off beats. There's uh, half, quarter, eighth, sixteenth notes that also have a chance to trigger. And variation, as you slide through it, changes the math allowing more opportunities and a higher percent chance that that stuff is going to happen. So this is relatively straightforward. And the variation knob is also the control that is voltage controllable. So if I hit it with a sine wave here, you can hear that it's the chance is increasing and decreasing and the and the complexity is increasing and decreasing. So that's how that works. So as we move down, we'll talk about the outputs. Um, really quickly, there's output A and output B. Right now, output A is a pitch. It's a CV signal and output B is a gate. These can be set using the mode so they can both be uh, CV. They can both be gates or as I'm using them now, we have a CV and a gate and you just set through the mode. It's written right here on the panel, VV, VG, and GG. So we just tap through. You can see the LEDs change up here to show you which mode you are in. That's one, that's two, that's three. We'll go back to two because that's where they are split. So they can be assigned. Uh, the clock button gives you a tap tempo clock when it's set to internal clock. If you're using an external clock, like over on the second given here, when you tap the clock, you can see the LEDs changing. This is the clock divider. So I can divide the incoming clock between divide by one all the way up to divide by seven, which is nice. And the way you do that is you would just hit mode clock and that's going to switch between internal or I'm sorry, external, internal, and then internal gate. And what internal gate is, the clock jack then, instead of outputting clock signal, like the internal clock mode does, it out turns a ran it outputs a random gate. <laughs> there is a manual for this available on the website. If you're interested in this module at all, I highly recommend you take a look at it because uh, like I mentioned in the manual, the point of this is to have you understand it, although I feel like the more I talk, the more confusing it's going to sound. When in reality, it's not that confusing, but it's sort of a strange concept. And uh, yeah, trying, I don't know. It's sort of an odd thing to explain. Anyway, so 
we can switch like i said we can switch between the clock modes by holding mode and pressing clock and that goes from external internal internal gate this is all in the manual one of the interesting things is if we are in external it's going to grab and remember that clock so as we switch to internal what's going to hold on to that same tempo even though uh, it's not using the external clock anymore they should remain relatively synced in a randomized way I suppose and then we can use clock mode and what that's going to do is that will if you're in external mode it'll reset the clock divider step one so you can essentially reset to sync it to step one um, and it, if you're in internal clock mode it clears all of the shift registers and sort of s essentially starts the random over again this module does remember the random voltages in every ship register when you turn it off and turn it back on again for the most part um, but if for some reason it it drifts into a space that you're not entirely excited about or it's doing something that uh, maybe you don't find as musical as you had hoped uh, you can just reset it and it'll st start doing it all over again um, Hopefully something wildly different from it did the time before. So you are uh, happier with it. <laughs> uh, voltage Research Lab for the UK either. You can get the Voltage Research Lab. That will be available in the UK. Uh, we're in the process of um, switching everything around in the back end and there's going to be a ton of there'll be there'll be news about that uh i don't know i'll have i don't know if we we're currently shipping to the uk or not i'll have to check the website um that would be a question for danielle i don't know the answer i know we are shipping to some uh countries in europe now and we're trying to get as many as possible but maybe danielle can chime in with that in the comments <laughs> okay, so that is a brief rundown of the Gibbon. It's a semi-random shift register. It's it's randomized in the context that you know it's it's going to play the same thing maybe depending on where you set it you could have it it could play the same thing up to 70 80 percent of the time all the way down to a five or ten percent of the time um, so it, it can be quite random and the same with the gates as well but again, all the documentation on the website is there, so you can take a deep dive in and sort of really understand it. I think the manual is actually, in this case, a better way to show all the different modes. But really, the, ult the point is, you know, it's very easy to just turn on and patch in here and say, okay, there's a random pitch. And you can sync it with a clock or just have it running free. Uh, that's another mode that it has. Most of the time, uh, it's synced to some sort of clock. Like the second one here is synced to the tap tempo clock of the first. However, there is a completely free running mode that you can set up that just completely ignores all the clock. And that's nice if you want something that's a little uh, less predictable. Maybe something that's a, um, a little less periodic so I've turned that on now and then in that case you have no the clock has no um, no influence whatsoever the internal clock anyway has no influence on whatsoever when, when it when it triggers it just sort of triggers on its own accord it could take anywhere from 40 milliseconds to three seconds to trigger Uh, Chase, 
Um, if you're dead set on getting a VL2, do you need to make sense to get a Gibbon? Uh, the implementation of the Gibbon and the VL2 is a little bit different because it the con the context is different. So the the context that it's in in the VL2 works for the VL2. Um, if you want two channels of pseudo random shift register for your Eurorack setup, then absolutely get this one. Um, otherwise, you could certainly wait for the Voltage Research Lab too. It will be included in there. Like I said, though, the, the implementation in the Voltage Lab is a little bit different, but <clears throat> the concepts are all the same. <laughs> if, that, if that helps at all. So let's go back here and... Press the crow a little bit. Now, if you've been watching my videos over the last three or four months, you know that I've been using these things for quite a while now. However, over the last week, I did spend a lot of time almost rewriting the Gibbon firmware, not from scratch, but I, I certainly went through each section and uh, spent a long time sort of deciding if there was something that was maybe it went too far or didn't go far enough or was interesting. There was a few features that just weren't interesting or useful. Uh, so I, I was I was able to cut them and clean up the interface and how you interact with, with it a little bit. And then there were, I had a couple ideas that I was like, ooh, this would be implemented really well. So uh, I'm really, really happy with how this thing is working. I think it sounds really interesting. How long have we been doing this? Let's see. Oh, 52 minutes. Well, we have plenty of time. So if you guys have, I was hoping to keep this to about an hour. So I have some time here. If you guys have any questions, feel free to uh, ask them at me in the chat and I can, I will read them and answer them. Otherwise, I'm going to continue to goof around with this thing. Thank you to everybody who has ordered. It only took a minute or two from the time I enabled the uh, modules on the store for someone to uh, dive in and order them. Um, I think what we can do, now that I think about it, and you can, if you want to mention this in the chat, in the UK, can you purchase through Reverb? I can put these modules up on Reverb and uh, then you could order them there. The limitations for us shipping to the UK are really just the, the shipping software and everything that we use in-house. But when we ship through Reverb, we can do it. So um, if you can purchase things on Reverb, let me know in the chat and I will put some up there so that everybody uh, around the world can get them. Because I know that's how we've been doing it for the other stuff. I know she's up, she's upstairs watching the. There she is, right there. She just added it. Perfect. See, so solving problems on a Friday night. Is there a release plan for the VL2? I gotta save up some money for it. There is a release plan. It's gonna come towards the end of the year. Closer to the end of the year than we wanted to. asks if there's going to be a Safari 2 set that might include snakes. You can see snakes poking its head in down here, and we have the flamingo over here. Uh, absolutely, there's going to be, I mean, it's, we're going to, as uh, we're working on different ideas for different projects, there's always little 
test modules like this that we put together to test various ideas. Uh, so we're just going to keep doing them. The next batch of the Safari modules uh, is going to be instead of two modules or three modules, I think it's just going to be two. It's going to be snakes and flamingo. I don't have a time for those yet. I have uh, finalized PCBs for both of them, so we'll see how long it takes. But those two will be series two. But that is for the future to talk about. But that should be really fun. Will there be a regular cadence for the VRL series? Um, I'm assuming you're asking if they'll be more available. Uh, the Voltage Lab 2 will be available worldwide from all the major retailers. And that's one of the things that's taken so long is uh, the Voltage Lab 2 is not being uh, hand assembled by me in the shop with Perry and Ross like the original Voltage Lab was. We really wanted to make an instrument, create something that we could sell to get, get it to every artist that wanted one. Uh, the Voltage Research Lab wasn't that instrument. It was extremely boutique and extremely time consuming to put together. So uh, one of the one of the main one of the main goals of the Voltage Lab 2 is really to design something that we could manufacture at a, a bit of a larger scale. So uh, everyone could get one. <laughs> when the mode is in GG, does output A and output B the same pattern? Oh, when it's in gate gate, do bo are both gates the same? No, they're not. In the same way that when they're, it's in uh, CV, CV or VV for voltage, voltage, they don't output the same voltage. Now they both share the same clock, but uh, the math for each one of them is completely different. So you will get completely different patterns. They both have their own uh, full shift register, so they're both working off of different shift registers. They're not even sharing buckets of voltages, so to speak. They have their own sequence. And along with the clock output as well, when you have it in random gate output mode instead of a clock, output or clock input, um, it's, that is also not going to match these guys down here. Just trying to squeeze sort of as much random out of it as possible because I thought, well, if there's two jacks, you can always malt, malt a gate. There's no reason to have them the same. Oh, it's just, well, it's... Jason, uh, with the VRL1, VRL2, VRL3 every few years, or is it just a coincidence this time? It's not really a coincidence this time. Uh, Voltage Research Laboratory, or Voltage Lab 1, really was, a, you know, it was a Kickstarter project. It was a very boutique, small-run synthesizer. Uh, we didn't make that many. We really couldn't make that many. For, you know, by the way it was manufactured, it was very difficult to manufacture. Voltage Research Lab 2, or Voltage Lab 2, uh, we're going to make a lot more, and it's 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 a bit of a different instrument. You know, it, it will stand on its own as an instrument. If you have the Voltage Research Lab, um, I think you're going to be interested in the Voltage Lab 2, and they'll play together side by side really nicely, but they're not the same instrument. Uh, I don't have any plans right now for a Voltage Lab 3, because Voltage Lab 2 really is meant to be out there and be... Uh, available to as many people as possible while people are still interested into it and it, it's it's meant to be um, sort of a larger scale product if that makes sense so it's it's the voltage lab 2 based on you know all the all the circuits are sort of uh, based on the circuits in the voltage lab although they at this point they've all been um, iterated or expanded upon um, but I, I don't see a Voltage Lab 3. I, I think Voltage Lab 2 says just about everything I want to say about that instrument. It, it allowed me to, it's going to allow me to get uh, those concepts out to everybody. I think that's probably the best way to put it.
So again, that's talking, sort of summing it up here. Uh, we have the Giraffe, which is a four channel, attenuating two plus two mixer. So you have channel one, channel two, channel three, channel four. It can be two separate two channel mixers, one four channel mixer. Three channel mixer with an attenuverter, two channel mixer with two attenuverters, or four attenuverters independent of each other. You can also use it as a malt. Not sure how much else I can fit into a mixer. Crow. <coughs> My throat is dry. The Crow is a overdrive state variable filter based on the Pittsburgh filter with a 75x gain drive to it. So you can just pummel sounds with it. You can just crush anything. Without it ever sounding unpleasant somehow. And that's sort of the magic of it. And then the Gibbon. You know, we spent a long time talking about the Gibbon. Gibbon is a randomized shift register that gives you pseudo-random uh, patterns and pseudo-random sequences um, to create some weird stuff. All right, I think that is it. I wanted to keep this one short because I want to pop it on the webpage for this stuff so you guys can... Uh, well, you've already seen it. But if you haven't watched this, although which is impossible, this is for you. This is for the people that haven't watched it. Unless you're watching it now, in which case, thank you for watching it. Yeah. All right, well, anyway, thank you guys. I think what I'm going to do is tear this apart and pour myself a nice tea. <laughs> yes, Clay, that was kind of, well, that was the purpose of it, was to see how far we could push it and have it still sound good. I wasn't sure. I honestly didn't think it would go anywhere near as far as it did. But what that does is it you sweep through these just beautiful ranges of harmonics. They're like little fields of harmonics. And depending on the pitch of the tone coming in or the, the shape of the waveforms coming in, it... It's just different sort of waves of flavors. I think that sounds really, really interesting. What would be a good small case, 60 to 80 HP for these new animals? Um, I don't know. The, the Create Nifty case is nice because, you know, it fits on the desk and I have one and I like it. That's what I use on my work desk upstairs in my dining room i have a uh, a nifty case that that's you know i use it to write firmware and to, but i want a small little patch so maybe try that check it out at least it's got some really really good power in it which is cool anyway thank you guys so much for uh watching this video and checking it out hanging out with me tonight i really really appreciate it i will talk to you very soon and see you later